All right. It's time to dive into 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the grace that you give, not only in salvation, but Lord, in sanctification. For my family in Jesus Christ, help us to know, Lord, that we can walk confidently, not in our own um, satisfaction, not in our own righteousness, certainly, but Lord, our confidence is in the Lord Jesus and his saving work and sanctifying work in us. And Lord, also help us to, to understand that there are plenty of people who think that they walk in the light, but the, the testimony of their life really says otherwise. Lord, we never want to assume that a person is saved or lost just on a guess, but uh, I would rather assume that a person is lost and be wrong than to assume that they're saved and be wrong. So teach us from your word that we may know these things. For your glory, for our good, we pray. Amen. All right. 1 John chapter 2. Y'all ready to dive in? Hey, I know it's a, it's a Wednesday and it's a work day, but was today not splendid? Yes. Yes. I got to the gym this morning and I, was, I had a long sleeve shirt on and Tim got there and he's like, it's cold. And he, he was talking about when he lived in Florida and I was like, I bet you're glad you're here now. But, and we will remember those folks tonight in our prayer time. Uh, but let me give you a couple of introductory notes. You've got that on your, on your worksheet. As you read the writings of John the Apostle, and this is a reminder, I've told you this before, consider how he uses words and phrases in all of his writings. I said last time that when John uses the word world, it's most often the word cosmos. But that word can be referring to people. It can be referring to a system. It can be referring to the, to the creation. And we see a similar thing here when he speaks of from the beginning. And in Greek, that's going to be the same wording as he will use it in other places. But whereas he, uh, where he talks about from the beginning, I think he's talking about there from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. He's not going all the way back to Genesis. But you just have to be careful not to assume that he uses a word one way and only one way. Let the context show you how he's doing that. And as far as our paragraph tonight, verses 7 through 11, it is my personal opinion that verses 7 and 8 really go together, and they're kind of new. And then verses 9 through 11 is John coming back to a point that he's already made in chapter 1. And he's doing, in my opinion, a combination. I told you when we started this study that there are three tests that John gives whereby the believer can walk in assurance and confidence. There's the doctrinal test. You've got to know the, which Jesus you believe and follow. There's the moral test. How are you walking? And there's the love test. And we're going to get, I believe, a glimpse of both the moral and love test in this very short paragraph. And you'll notice that we have uh, there on your worksheet five questions, one from each verse. And that doesn't mean that, they're, that these are all of the questions. But remember, on our Wednesday nights, we take a portion of our time to, to generally walk through this letter, but also we save time uh, for dedication to pray because we need to be a praying people. And I, I don't think that's just individually. I think that's congregationally as well. So these are not the only questions, obviously, but let's dive in. I'm just going to read the whole text here, and you'll notice on your worksheet, they line up just like they are on the board. 1 John 1, excuse me, 1 John 2, 7 through 11. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him, that's Christ, and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now let me give you just one little notation here. Whenever you see the word you, 
love that I'm writing to you. Uh, it's here. Another one that you. So I'm writing to you. I think that covers those. Those are all in plural in the original language. It's you all. I'm writing to you all, a collection of believers, or at least professing believers. That's just a little bit of a note. But let's consider something in question number one. What do you think, and notice I'm going to put quotes here, the old commandment is that John refers to in verse 7. Verse 7, beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment. And last time I made the, the point that I think this is actually talking about the, the word from Jesus. It's not speaking of the Mosaic law. So remember that. Oh, and then in verse 8, we also have commandment there too. In tole, those are all the, from the same word. What do you think that is, this uh, old commandment? Any guesses? Somebody turn over to 2 John. And just to irk my pastoral brethren, turn to 2 John chapter 1. There's only one chapter in 2 and 3 John. I think the answer is this. Who would read for us verse 5 of 2 John? I think that's the commandment that he's talking about. So where did John get that? Any, any guesses? Think back. Okay, we're going through the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings. Through 10 cover a time period of over three years and that's his public ministry you get into chapter the end of chapter 10 now you're at the feast of dedication which is going to be you know there toward the end of our calendar year and then you're coming up on his crucifixion just three months later or so three to four months later when you get to that part of john chapter 10 and then you get into chapter 11 and 12 the the time frame gets really tight Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are a few hours one night. And even into chapter 18, that, that's still a part of that night. That's, what, what, is, what is that? What are, they, what are they observing in those, in those chapters? Do you all know? The Passover. Passover, the Lord's Supper. And then, of course, Jesus is going to go and be handed over. Well, in that section where he is talking to the disciples in that upper room, he, he just comes out and says it. I'm giving you a new commandment. In John chapter 13, verse 34, here's what Jesus says. Let me turn there and I'll read it to you. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And then verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another now, if you want to challenge me i don't mind I, i'm not professing to be absolute uh absolutely right all of the time I, I never make that but i do think i've got a pretty good argument to say that's what i think john is referring to here interjections thoughts i agree because so much of the new testament starts with the one another we're yeah. getting to see that after this john 13 verse 34 it's almost a one another discourse marching through the rest of the new testament so jesus hit it over and over the apostle paul picks up on that theme the people of god in collection i think i would say the congregation it is a big theme especially in the new testament not that it's not there in the old but jesus did not save us so that we could be independent warriors walking separately from the body of christ are there instances where people have had to do that? Yes. But is that the normative New Testament pattern? No. God saves us individually, but for community. And here's the thing. It's, it's tough to love one another when you're together. I mean, it just is. 
I'm not the easiest person to love. Don't ask Annabelle or April. Just don't. But I'm telling you. Or my sister even. I don't want to be that way. And I'm certainly trying to grow in my sanctification. But some people are like, well, I got hurt. You know, I just don't do well with the church. That's not a legitimate excuse. It's just not. Now you say, well, what about the people over in Indonesia who are in prison for Jesus? Well, if you want to switch places with them, they probably would if you want that kind of independence. But God has saved us individually, but for community. So the old commandment is... I think that we, as the body of Christ, love one another. We've heard it from the beginning. Again, I think John is, is remembering back to that, to that night when he heard those words from Jesus. The old commandment is the word. That's hologos. That's the word that you have heard. The word about whom? Come on, scholars. It's a pretty easy answer. Jesus, there you go. He is the Word incarnate. What is John chapter 1? First 18 verses. It's called prologue. Remember, we covered that. The Word became flesh and what? Dwelt among us. Jesus spoke the Word. He gave us the Word of God. So, I think it's that we love one another and it is a commandment given from Jesus back in John 13, 34. Any thoughts or questions on verse 7? I'm not trying to rush, but at the same time, I'm trying to make sure we don't give 35 minutes to one verse and fly through the others. I just think it's interesting he cycles that word there, so he's really making a point. If, you know, the Bible can be literary in some parts, it can be circular, circular, but I think that he's emphasizing that word over and over so that we can't help but get it. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. hear things one way, but he's going to... It's matter. repetition. Yeah. And, but, and, and that's a common technique. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, but think about that even in... The secularist would even say, yeah, my dad used to say this all the time to me. Well, why? Because e either we hear it and get it and don't care, or we hear it and get it and then don't really live it. I mean, there's a reason for repetition. And yeah, he's, he's driving the point home. John is the human author. God is the divine author. God knows us well. Uh, now, now let's look at verse 8 because it sounds like he's contradicting himself. At the same time, it is a new commandment. <laughs> so what does John in verse 8 mean when he says that it is a new commandment? Greg, you're smiling. Do you have a, a thought, an input? Well, I think the key is uh, the first word new is kainos, not neos. Yeah. Yeah. Which means something novel. Yeah. And basically, he's saying, essentially, he's reiterating what Jesus taught his disciples. Yeah. Well, and and again, I, I've told you all, and I know that not everyone has been has been able to be here for every sermon. But when I was doing uh, the the introduction there to the Gospel of John, I think that John, the Gospel of John, is largely evangelistic. That's my opinion. Not everyone is with me on that. I've got, uh, I've got a, you know, I'm on the side of a few solid theologians. But I, I think that, that the Gospel of John, because John 20, 31, that's the whole reason why he writes it. I'm writing these things. Why? So that you'll know who Jesus is. Well, man, Daryl, don't you think we've got it yet? I mean, chapter, you know, one, he's, he's the, the Word and he's dwelt among us. Chapter two, he turns water to wine. He, he heals people. Chapter four, goes to the Samaritans. Chapter five, heals a lame man. I mean, We've worked our way through this. Now he's, he's made a blind man see. Well, John actually only gives you a snapshot of all that Jesus did and what for. So that you'll know who Jesus is. So that you'll believe. So that you'll have life in his name. 1 John 5.13, however, in one of the so that statements or the reasons for writing, he says, I'm writing to those of you who do believe. I want you to be assured. I want you to have confidence that you know the Lord, that he knows you. Well, uh, Greg, I, I'm with you there. I, I think he's just coming back to the reality that it's not brand new, but you haven't maybe thought of this. I was there when he said to us, I'm giving you this commandment. It's not optional that you love one another. He even prayed in John 17, and that was Judas Iscariot had been dismissed. Father, 
Make them one like we are. Jesus wants his people to walk in true unity, not, not a facade, not uh, let's pretend that we like each other and pretend to get along. No, he wants us to walk in unison with him and in unison with one another. Now, there are detractors from that, false doctrine. We can't walk in unison with all the false doctrine. But this is the heartbeat of the Lord Jesus that we walk in love. Yeah. Let me just say one thing. You know, you've got to wonder what the disciples thought in their minds was going to be the great big thing Jesus was going to tell them. Yeah. You know, <laughs> take over the world, um, do this big thing, do this big thing. What was the big thing Jesus told to them? And it was so novel. Yeah. Just love one another. Love one another. Yeah, John the Baptist was like, why am I in jail? You're supposed to come in here and destroy Rome and s establish your kingdom and rule. And the disciples were no different. I mean, these were, this is how the Jew thought largely. You know, he's coming. He's going he's gonna to rule and reign. And Jesus comes in and doesn't m meet up to what they had expected of him. And he gives them something that seems like, oh, bummer. But it's not. In, in John 13, 35, he said, by this, all people will know that you belong to me, that you're my disciples, in that you love one another. Now, does loving one another mean that we never have conflict? No. It means, though, that when we have conflict, our resolution is ultimately in the gospel and because of the gospel, and it better be resolution that Jesus gives his seal of approval to. Unfortunately, psychobabble has made its way into the church, and we technique reconciliation, and, and that's the world's way. The gospel is enough to remind us that we as sinners have been reconciled to God in Christ and therefore we can be reconciled one to another. We're going to have times when there's uh, maybe we sin and sometimes it is intentional. Sometimes we might hurt someone and not even mean to, but nonetheless we've hurt. We seek for reconciliation because Christ sought to reconcile us. See how that works? So. Uh, and, and one other thing here, walking in love. It is unfortunately easy to just grasp at an idea of what Scripture means and miss what it means. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and I'm going to make a confession. I think I've made this confession before. I would rather read him than listen to him. I, don't, don't throw stones at me. Don't. I, I like Alistair Begg because he could read Curious George and I would be um, and that's a preference thing. That's a preference. The so preference doesn't really matter. D. Martin Lloyd Jones. Um, oh man, I just lost where I was going to go with that. Mm. Yeah, okay, some agree. Yeah. But you'll hear these great preachers who just adore it. And, and he is good. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, oh, but I know where I'm going. He talked about the importance of thesis and antithesis in preaching. What something is, what it is not. What it does, what it does not do. The world wants to redefine love or, or to give its definition. But see, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 was not talking about romantic love. He's talking about what the love of God is. He says, it is this, but it is not this. It does do this, but it does not do this. Now, people don't like that. Why? Yet, and it confines them to what, wait, there, there are boundaries? Oh, there are boundaries. And then people are like, well, we don't need boundaries. Okay, and I've used this so many times. Well, let your pharmacist have that idea when it comes to your medicine. Well, no, we need those boundaries. Well, we need this one too. We can't just decide what love's gonna be or what we want it to be. God has told us what it is, what it's not, what it does do, what it doesn't do. So when Jesus says, love one another, that is going to be tied to what the Word of God reveals to be love. So when someone says, well, I believe I can love whoever I want to. Well, God says otherwise. Oh, where does he say that? Well, he defines righteousness and unrighteousness, and love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. So anything under that category heading, unrighteousness, sin, anything God is not in favor of. Is it a love? Oh yeah, it's a love, but it's a wrong love. It's a sinful love and God does not accept it. See, but when you start teaching and preaching like that, people, they, they want to wiggle away from that because it's too confining and too constraining. 
but it's best. It's absolutely best. And I hope I didn't lose everyone. I didn't mean to, to go all, I'm not really trying to chase a rabbit or go on a tangent. I'm just trying to show you that when we, when we study Scripture, we need to remember the rest of Scripture. So the new commandment that's not really new, but it's novel, I think is that, that we love one another and God defines the terms of what that looks like. So if someone comes into Grace Fellowship and says, hey, y'all, I'm a member here. You know, I went through the prospective members class, met with the elders, shared my testimony. They were confident that I've believed the gospel. And I told them I want to be a part of this fellowship. I have the best news. My girlfriend and I were living together in sexual sin and, and just celebrate that with us. No, you're going to get discipline. And if you don't repent, which means you stop doing that, we'll give you all the room we can, but you'll be removed. Well, that's not very loving. Oh, no, no. It, it's, a, it's absolutely loving. It is the loving thing to do. You know, if I was playing with electricity when I was a kid, my dad wouldn't have said, oh, that's, he'll learn. We probably won't. Well, he might for a second. You know, die. You know, if you love someone, you actually step in and say this, not this, that, not that. So. Well, and to your point earlier about it referring back to Christ, the reality is humans, we want to love ourselves best. And, and the Bible assumes that we do. It never, never tells us to, it just assumes that we do. And, and so Jesus is trying to show them over and over with word and action and deed that he's constantly laying down his life. He's washing their feet when that isn't yeah. his job, but he takes it on anyway. Hmm. He takes the lowest servant. He is constantly through all of that saying love one another. Because they're fighting over who's going to be first in the kingdom. And he's saying love one another. He knows it doesn't. It should come naturally for yeah. us. But, but it we doesn't. Are, we are laden with our fleshly desires that want what we want. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but what had he just been talking about? <laughs> he's talking about his suffering. Yes. I, I'm going to go and be handed over. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be crucified. Hey, which one of us will be the greatest? Are, are you hearing what I'm telling you? Right. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we have, a, we have a, a heart problem. It's an idol factory. I, that's not original for me. I'm borrowing that. The, the, one idol is dealt with, another one is ready to take its place. So, yeah. And we've got a darkness problem. Well, we're going to get to that. Don't cheat, Greg. Just because you're an elder doesn't give you permission to cheat. No. <laughs> We are going to get to that phrase, and, and that phrase is, is of particular interest um, because it speaks of in. Now, you know, there's in love. In other words, there's, there's something that, it, it's again, has defining points to it. But let, let's move on now to verse 9. Uh, your third question, what is revealed in verse 9 about the one who claims to be in the light but hates his brother? First of all, what do you think that that phrase, in the light, is a euphemism for? In Christ. So what are we talking about? Believer? Okay, I think so. I think what we have in verse 9 is a person, whoever, says, I'm in the light. That's their, that's their profession or their confession. Anyone can do that. Anyone. So John says, okay, if you say you're in the light, you prayed the prayer, you were sincere and cried, we'll see you in heaven. Except he doesn't. Keeps writing. You say you're in the light and you hate your brother. Then you're what? Still in darkness. So I'm going to now go with Greg. And I have this in my personal notes. I have it circled. Yeah, and I was aiming at the end of verse 8, really, Daryl. You know, you're right. You're right, brother. Because I, I missed that one. You're... I apologize. I mean that. I mean that. I, I, I got so excited, but I'm, I'm trying to find these uh, in darkness, in the darkness. Scotia. Not that you have to know the Greek word. By the way, folks, in the early days of my preaching ministry, uh, I do think it, it's beneficial to know words, but I remember someone told me one time, and it was not my intention, they said, Brother Darrell, I can't understand the Bible like you, can I? And I went, what do you mean? They said, well, unless I know the original language, I, I can't. There's no point reading it. I was like, oh, I've, I have messed up severely here. <laughs> so I'm not trying to impress you with words, but the phrasing, okay, we're in the light 
is, is a euphemism for, I think, being a believer. In the darkness or in darkness, does, does that look like a believer would be described that way? No. And what is John doing in this epistle? I'm writing to those of you who believe so that you'll know you believe. But as we are going to get to later in chapter 2, he reminds them there were some who were among us, but they weren't really of us. There's always that tension in the church that people make confession, but then do not actually show that they have believed the gospel. That is one of the things that I, I think it's plaguing the, the church in the United States of America. And probably not just here, but I, I think that when you hear about statistics of 75% of, of U.S. citizens are Christians, I think that number is not even, not only not close to that, I think it's significantly less than that. And that's not me being a Judaizing Pharisee. That's simply me saying, well, here's what Scripture says, and here's what we're seeing. So, person says that they're in the light, but hates his brother. Strong word, hates. Hates his brother. What does John say? He's still in darkness. But contrast that to... To verse 8, mm -hmm. where he talks about that novel love. He says, which is true in him, in, in him. What? Mm -hmm. and in you. Yep. And basically, he's telling you that what is true in Christ is also true in you. The believer. And if it's not true in you, because the darkness should be passing away. Yeah. What did John already deal with in chapter 1? Do... Do Christians uh, not sin? No, we still sin. Chapter 2, verse 1, I write to you that you may not sin, but, not, a, not as an excuse, not as a free pass, but I know what it is to walk in the flesh. I know what it is to be human, even on this side of, of Christ and, and believing Him. But what we ought to see, yeah, there's this progression where, where darkness is becoming less and less. And I say this not to brag because it really isn't Daryl, but the more I grow in Christ, I'm telling you folks, the less the taste of sin satisfies. Now in no way, shape, or form am I telling you all that I don't sin. I wished I could say that in truth. I, I really do. But sin is leaving a more bitter aftertaste more and more. For the per remember we've already dealt with this well I'm a carnal Christian no such thing no such thing a person who says I'm in Christ but I'm going to live how I please is not a person who understands what it is to surrender to Christ but the Daryl I was there at church that night I mean they were squalling squalling I think that's a soddy word I remember man they were they were really moved they, they were crying and Tears going everywhere, and we had to get Kleenexes out. I mean, they made God a hundred promises. I remember it. But that's it. And their life has not changed. They had an emotional response in a moment. But anyone can have that. But John is talking about something far different, about the person who has actually, in some sense, beheld God and realized, I don't deserve to be here, God. I need your mercy. I need your grace, your forgiveness, and your love. And I know I don't, I'm not worthy of it. And God, when he gives that, you, you don't want to just keep running this sin. You don't. You don't. So, so yeah, the, the darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. I think that the true light there is referring to Christ. I do. Going again back to how John speaks in John chapter 1 of his gospel account. But you say you're in the light, yet you hate your brother. Your confession and your actions aren't matching. You say this, but this is the reality. Now, I want to give this as a very small caveat. Because I know that there are times when even, I think, genuine believers can really take a dive and, and go for a, a big tumble. I didn't say, I've been backslidden for 27 years. No, no. I borrow this from Mark Dever, who is the senior pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. Dealing with this issue, he says, whenever I encounter people like this, for the most part, here's, here's what I say. 
I cannot absolutely say that you're not in Christ because I don't know that for certain. But there is no way that I could confidently affirm you as a brother or a sister. You say, well, at least we got that. Friend, you don't ever want that. If the collective body of believers who are proving, not, not, not that they're Pharisees, but they, you can't deny that Jesus is doing a work in them, when they, when they look at you, not with judgmental, uh, you know, suspicious eyes of you'll never measure up, but, but loving and tender eyes saying, we just can't affirm you as a brother or a sister. That ought to shake you at your very core. That's what that should do. And this isn't about living up to Daryl's standard or even Grace Fellowship's standard. This is about anyone can say they know the Lord, but not everyone who says that they do actually does. Daryl, I think that point, verse 9. Yes, sir. I think we need to understand saying is one thing. <laughs> yeah. But love is an action. Yes, sir. It is more than an emotion. It's more than a verbalization. I don't know what words used here for love. Is it agapao? Is it epithymia? Or is it phileo? I don't know what the Greek word is used there. But I know that love is an action. It's agapeo. It's actually plural there. It, no, it, it's actually in verse in verse 10. That's, that's the root word agape. Okay. Yeah. But you know... I've got it right here. In, in the idea of further revelation, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 lists 15 things that love does. Mm -hmm. So love is primarily an action yeah. accompanied by feelings, yes. Yeah. But I think Jesus is addressing here, you can say all you want to, but if you don't act it, you ain't got it. Yeah, I can tell my wife that I love her, but if I beat her, but if you don't ever do the dishes right. or do the windows. And what is she going to do? She's, she's going to actually say to me, you know, you, you say that you love me. That's what you keep saying. Yeah. Yet you, you harm me. You, you never help. You never actually show anything. You, you never, you, you will drop everything for, for this person or that person or this group or that group. I, and it's not like being selfish, but yeah, it, it would say, you can tell me and you can give me a card that says I love you and da 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 da, but you never back that up with your actions. Well, how much more so with the Lord Jesus? I'll give you all this real quick. Um, in my early 20s, this was back when Tennessee was really, really good. Really good. I remember it well. I would get up to go watch a Tennessee game very early. I mean, I, I needed to be there, you know, seven hours before kickoff just in case the coach called on me and said, hey, no, you're not in school here, but but anyway, and I came home after a game, and and it was a Sunday morning, and I was still living at home, and, and Daddy asked me, which was rhetorical, and he said, "Well, Daryl, weren't you like 20? Yeah, but I still lived at home, so still his rules." I said, "You going to church?" Like I, you know, really could give an answer of yes or no. He he wasn't really searching for that, but but I said, "I don't know. I'm pretty tired." And he goes, he said. Uh, now, yesterday, you were gone all day. Where, where, where were you? I said, well, I went to Knoxville. Oh, yeah, Tennessee played. Then my dad knew. He said, what time was kickoff? I said, 3.30. What time do you leave? I went, 6, 6.30. And he goes, 6.30, nine hours. Was it that long to get there? I said, well, no. I mean, we want to get there, and we want to have fun with people. We want to, you know, mingle and eat and do all this stuff. He goes, okay. Well, did somebody give you tickets? Well, no, we had to buy those. He goes, okay. But I, I'm sure you left at halftime. Well, no, no, we stayed for the whole game and we stayed another two hours afterwards. That's why I didn't come home until three in the morning or, or whatever, or midnight one. He goes, okay. And this is what my dad did. He said, okay, son. He said, you say that you love Jesus. But what I'm seeing in your life as a consistent pattern is everyone and everything but Jesus has your heart. Nobody had to wake you up yesterday morning to go to Knoxville because you wanted to go. No one had to ask you to, to take your own money and buy a ticket because you wanted it. Nobody asked you to go to the game, stay for the whole thing, and then stay later. And how many times did you eat? Three at least. Did people just give you food? No, no, I had to buy that. He goes, so everything that I'm seeing, and my dad's not a legalist, but he was saying everything that I'm seeing in you says I love Jesus, but 
I don't really have the energy to get up and go two blocks over to church, but I could drive a hundred miles yesterday one way and back, spend all this money and time and get expended. What's that? I mean, that, and, and y'all think, boy, Howard was mean. It's one of the best lessons I ever got. I didn't like it at the time. I just, I was like, oh, oh, well, okay. And I went and I took my shower and I got ready and I went to church. And Jesus was obviously just so adoring that I came and sat in church. No, but what my dad did for me in that moment was, son, you can say it all you want to, but your life is actually going to tell us what you really want. Man, that stuck me. Was that the, I mean, did everything change overnight? No, but you know what started happening? When I was saying yes to everyone and everything but Jesus, it started tasting bad. So anyway, well, you're right, Brother Bob. We can say it all day, but the proof's gonna be in the pudding. It really is. I know it sounds simple and cliche, but it is really like that. That's the reason we're told to love our enemies. I don't want to have, have to kiss and kiss him. <laughs> yeah. I can act toward yeah. him in an agape, do what is yeah. right toward him. Yeah, you, you come along and you find your, your enemy and his ox is in the ditch. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm going to laugh. No, you're not. Jesus <laughs> <laughs> That's Greg. <laughs> Jesus is not. I'm not giving you that as a valid option. Now, you might do that, but that's... I already mentioned John 13. You know, Jesus stooped down and washed dirty feet. Leslie, didn't you mention that? Guess who was in attendance? Now, now he wasn't in attendance for the entire meal, but, it, but who was still there when Jesus stooped down and washed dirty feet? Judas Iscariot. The very one who would kiss him on the cheek, not in some romantic way, but as a sign of that's, that's the one. Jesus stooped down and washed those dirty feet, the one he knew was going to betray him and hand him over. Well, Darrell, you just don't understand what this person did to me. I don't, and I don't have to. Here's what I can tell you Jesus did. He loved his enemy. And even on the cross, he loved his enemies. As I've loved you, love one another. That phrase, as I have loved you, is fairly significant. Not just, well, love one another. Do you take the model of my life as I have loved you, sinner, I've rescued you. I have borne the wrath of God the Father in your place. I've loved you. Now go love one another. Like that. I'm not trying to teach a different letter, but I think that in Paul's letter to Philemon, I don't think that the theme is just reconciliation. I think it's reconciliation in and because of the gospel. Paul doesn't just want Philemon and Onesimus to get together. He says, where he was lost, now he's found. I make an appeal to you on behalf of him because Christ made an appeal for me. And he, is, he has wronged you. There's a debt. I'm not asking you to, to not collect. I'm just asking you to transfer the debt from him to me. Paul, why would you do that? Because I had a debt I could never pay transferred from me to Christ. And that's why I'm willing to stand here and say, Philemon, whatever he owes you, you charge to my account. I've had a debt far greater paid for me. I can do this. As I have loved you, love one another. It's yeah. big, isn't it? It's such a testimony to the Lord's work in Paul's life. Yeah. That does that. <laughs> there, there's no room left in his heart for him. And for you to say, charge me for the debt, yeah. that, that's Christ is just so ticking over his heart. He has compassion on the situation. He knows there's wrong, but he's saying, charge it to me, I'll take care of it. Let's get back to loving one another. And was Philemon a Jew or a Gentile? He's a Gentile. Gentile. <laughs> God did a radical transformation in Paul, but that's what he does in us, right? And so when we feel like we can, well, Daryl, I don't have to like these people. They're not my, they, their skin color is darker than mine or lighter than mine, or their ethnicity, really. They're from a different continent. I don't deal with those people. You, when, uh, when William Carey wanted to take the gospel to the heathen in India, you know what Baptist preachers told him? Let God deal with the heathen. And I think William Carey basically said, well, you know we're in that crowd too, right? We didn't find him, he found us. Let God deal with that mess. Let me tell you something, you were the mess that he dealt with. You better remember that. 
and nothing in us ever deserved it. And God showed mercy like we can't even grasp. We have got to see our fellow man, our fellow woman, as made by God in His image and for His glory. It's hard to hate them when you're praying for them. It's hard to hate them when you see them as made in God's image. Even when they are flaunting their godlessness, even when they are celebrating sin, they are broken and ruined by their sin, but still made in God's image. Got to remember that. Y'all, I'm really not trying to, to rush, but I'm going to rush us just because we have uh, verses 10 and 11. And, and we're not going to exhaust this. We know that. But let's, let's consider in, uh, in verse 10, what is revealed in this verse about one who loves his brother? Whoever loves his brother. So we have the, the contrast of hating brother. Now we have loving brother. Whoever loves his brother does what? Abides. General Greek word meno, and it's in the ongoing <laughs> tense. You abide in the light. You remain. You're, you can't get out of it, and you don't want to. You abide. You remain in the light. Again, I think this is actually picturing Christ and, and the Christian faith. You love your brother. You abide in the light. And, and because of that, there's no cause for your stumbling. Why is there no cause for stumbling here? And keep in mind the contrast between light and darkness. Why is there no cause for stumbling? There's light, there's nothing to stumble over. There you go. You see. Paul, Paul, when writing to the Galatians, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit and then the deeds of the flesh, he who walks by the Spirit does not carry out the desire of the flesh. So you say, well, I actually do sometimes carry out the desire of the flesh. Then you're not walking by the Spirit in that. That's how we know. Several years ago, I think it was my second year at Southwestern, so this would have been somewhere 2002, 2003. Myself and a guy named Chris McKinney, you all, some of you have met Chris, and another guy named Nathan Lawrence, who's a pastor from Kentucky, but I think in Alabama now. We decided to drive from Fort Worth to Carlsbad Caverns because we thought, man, let's get out of Fort Worth. Let's go to a big town. Carlsbad Caverns is about the size of this room, except for underground. They get us 800 feet below the surface. And they say, hey, everyone, we'll tell you the story. Have a seat, but everyone needs to sit down. Oh, no, that's the rule. So we all sit down and he's talking and talking. Boom, the lights go off. And I was like, because <gasps> there is nothing to adjust to. There is no light, no hint of light. You are in utter darkness. And it was one of the weirdest, creepiest feelings I've ever experienced. It felt like someone was pressing in on my chest. And I couldn't breathe well. And I remember thinking, actually, I wish I could tell you that even as a seminarian, I was thinking spiritually, but I thought this was my first thought. This is what it's like to be Ray Charles. And I don't mean that to be funny, but this is what blindness must be like, except I actually can remember colors. But then I thought, this is spiritual darkness. You can't see anything. Could I have physically stood up and walked? Sure. It wouldn't have gone well for me because the Lord didn't make Carl's bad caverns out of nerf. It's rocks. There's crevices. But it's a, it's a most overwhelming, awful feeling to be in darkness. But the one who loves his brother is actually abiding in the light. And in him there's no cause for stumbling. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? On the flip side, when a brother or sister is not loving their brother rightly, what's happening there doesn't mean that they're lost but they're not rightly walking in the light and, and you know we're stumbling and we'll try to justify well they said this or you know what they didn't include me in that party or we'll try to justify it all day but then the lord says uh-uh no not at all but lord this this fleshy pride sometimes still feels really good it's going to kill you going to stumble nobody needs that i call people i save people i want them to walk confidently in me i want them to walk yes the straight and narrow if you will walk because of uh, you're in the light you can see no 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 follow me <coughs> and whoever loves his brother is abiding in the light that's what he does it's it's ongoing mm -hmm. there's no cause for stumbling now, there are times, again, when, yes, we don't do that, but God may, may God quickly alert us to that, to where we say, no, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm sinning right here, and this isn't good. 
no matter what my brother or sister did or what I have perceived them to do. Sometimes it's that. I had that happen as a pastor at South Whitwell. Someone said, well, you said this. And I said, if I said that, I need to apologize. And I said, will you let me go listen to the sermon? They said, yes. So I did. And I listened to the sermon and I called them back and I said, hey, I listened to the sermon. Well, you didn't really say what I said you said. I went, well, that, that's true because I listened to the sermon. And well, you, you implied it though. I said, well, let me just say what I said. Well, actually, I guess it's just how I took it. I said, so we went from I said it to I implied it to it's just how you took it. And then the person did say, you know what? I'm sorry I wasted your time. That happened. So, so we don't always hit the mark, but, but when we don't, may the Lord alert us quickly and may we seek true reconciliation, not just sweeping something under the rug, not just pretending to be nice, but actually saying, brother, sister, I hurt you. I said something about you. I failed Christ and I failed you and I'm asking you to forgive me. Oh, that the church will see how that pleases the heart of God and how he grows that church. It's like a broken bone. I heard that it's better to break a bone than to sprain one, or like sprain a ligament, because a broken bone grows back together usually better and stronger. Not, not that we need to be intentionally trying to hurt each other, <laughs> but may we continue walking in the light. Again, I want to leave time for prayer. Verse 11, or uh, yeah, number five, in verse 11, what else do we find out about the one who hates his brother? Let's, let's consider it. Not only, okay, we've got in verse 9, he, he's professing to be in the light, but actually he's hating his brother. And then John says, whoever hates his brother, and that too is ongoing. Whoever hates his brother, is he dabbling with, with the darkness? Is it lightly a, a touching him? What is it, Kathy? He's in it. Well, now wait a second. That would mean he's not in the light. You can't be in the light and in the darkness. But I was there at the church service when he said this. Kathy, I, I heard the tears. I actually heard them. I actually, I meant to say I heard the cries and saw the tears. And that, Kathy, Kathy, that was my daughter. That, that was my grandson. Uh, folks, this is the kind of stuff you deal with. And I'm not trying to be a jerk. But people want to think things because they love someone dearly. But friend, you can't play around with this. You can get paint colors wrong all day. You can't afford to get justification wrong. There, there's no coming back from that after, after death. So, so you hate your brother, which means what? You're not in the light. And, and again, this is not talking about a believer who is struggling, which does have... This is a person, I think, who is saying, look, I hate him. And I'm not changing. I'm perfectly content, perfectly happy staying right here. Then you're not in the light. But I'm on the church roll. Well, that's going to change. Well, I'll, you do that and I'll sue you. Do what you need to do. But you can't say this. You can't be this. It's not just saying, but you can't be this and live like this and be in the light. You can't. You're a legalist. No, I'm, I'm being biblical. You hate your brother. You're in the darkness. You walk. There's peripateo, ongoing sense. You walk in the darkness. You do not know where you're going. Why? Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What did we see in John chapter 9, there in verses 35 to 41, Jesus, who had healed the blind man physically, then, it, then goes and finds him and says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, sir, who is he that I may believe? And Jesus says, you're talking to him right now. And he says, I believe. And then Jesus turns. And there's a group of Pharisees. And he talks about blindness. He goes, are you saying that we're blind too? If you really recognized the true condition of your heart, you wouldn't claim to be able to see. But as it is, you, you think you see, that's why you're still blind. Until you grasp your lostness, you'll never see your need for a Savior. The Savior. You're in the darkness. You walk in the darkness. You don't know where you're going. Why? Because the darkness has blinded you. You don't see. And the sad part is you think that you do. Well, I believe in once saved, always saved. So do I. But don't do bad things with that doctrine. That's one of the reasons why some denominations think that we teach and believe easy believism, which we do not. You cannot. You cannot have one foot in the darkness and one foot in the light and think 
you know, I'll probably make it okay. Friend, this is, a, this is an affirmation, an encouragement from John to the believer, and a warning to the false confessor. Don't y'all love cheery messages? <laughs> there's a lot that's cheery. But there's a lot that's very alarming. Yeah. But it, the most loving thing I can do is to tell you the truth about when they were little and boy they did in their arms with you. And, I'm doing and, it now, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being comfortable, actually. But no, truly, the most loving thing we can do, and this is so capsulized without any room for doubt, light and darkness are mutually exclusive in these five um, verses right here. And John has gone out of his way. One of the things that I learned in a former job I had was if people don't get it this way, you say it this way. If they don't get it this way, you say it that you say it until they grasp it. And he has gotten out of his way to help people understand you can't have a little bit of this and you can't have a little bit of yeah. that. And he is doing us a favor. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty. He's do and he starts off beloved. So he already sets the tone. Yeah, it's actually a very gracious tone. We do not let doctors get away with, with medical malpractice, or at least we don't intend to, right? We don't want to let lawyers get away with legal malpractice, pharmacists getting away with malpractice, engineers getting away with structural malpractice, because I don't want to drive across their bridge if they don't know what they're doing. But in the church, well, what's it matter? As long as you know we're, oh, it matters, friend. Don't let me or any other pastor you know or even a fellow believer get away with theological malpractice. Yeah, and in the name of unity, think of that unity. Which is not real, it's not good unity. Right. Look, I've said it this way. Al-Qaeda, they're unified. ISIS, unified. It's just not good unity. But they're really unified, at least to a large degree. This unity at all costs is not from the Bible true unity which Jesus Christ produces and I think that Paul's letter to the Philippians is largely the unity that Christ produced now you preserve by his power but it's his unity we don't come up with it and add to it y'all I'm gonna I'm gonna shut it down there not not that we couldn't go longer y'all are a good bunch um, there's obviously we are never going to exhaust all of scripture but uh, but I pray that this has been an encouragement to those who are the followers of Christ any who are or who are here or watching on YouTube that you, you might say well Daryl I'm a lot more like verse uh, 9 and, and verse 11 the friend repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ that's 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 our prayer for you but bow with me I'm gonna pray and then either Leslie or Kathy will, will hit the button whenever I'm done ladies I was trying to be gentle with my cue right there so let's pray father thank you for the time and the word oh God may the believer rejoice or not in pride because there's <clears throat> nothing to be prideful about our boast is in Christ and him alone I pray that that we will be a unified body of believers because of Jesus because of the gospel, in the gospel, Lord, unify us. And I pray for any false confessor that they will actually recognize their blindness and cry out to you for mercy. And Lord, they'll find it. Save the perishing, we pray. Amen.